<laughs> she is the executive director of Peer Sports Space and is going to tell you a little bit about it. And I hope you enjoy the show. Hi, everybody. How is everyone doing? Awesome. I'm so happy we're doing well. And I also want to say it's OK if you're not OK. <laughs> Welcoming everyone as they are here today. My name is Yasmin. I use she or they pronouns. I'm the co-founder and executive director for Peer Support Space. We're a community of people with lived experience navigating mental health challenges, life struggles, grief, trauma, whatever it might be. And our hope is that whatever someone's navigating, they don't have to navigate it alone. Um, someone living with uh, CPTSD, dissociative disorder, trauma, chronic pain, traumatic brain injury. Um, and at Peer Support Space, I can show up as my full authentic self, whether that is being a multiple gender loving person, being an immigrant, being Jewish, uh, having my mental health struggles. So our hope is that there's just spaces where we could breathe out and just be, where we're chosen family heals together. All of our resources are free. We have um, group, uh, both identity focused and general spaces, both in person and virtual. We also have one-to-one -one peer support, and we're really excited actually just one block that way. We're soon going to be opening Florida's first peer-led respite, and actually the first one focused on the LGBTQ community in the nation. <laughs> We've all been in a point in our lives where we just need to stare at a wall for three days. And I have never once been like, let me take a nice relaxing break at the mental health hospital. So the hope is that it's somewhere people could come for a few days for free and stay overnight and it's voluntary and there's people with lived experience, there's activities that you can partake in or not partake in. And we're just really, really excited to have this resource for the community. So I appreciate you all being here. Another really wonderful thing that we do is we have our creative arts workshops. Um, a lot of times arts lets me express stuff that otherwise is really hard for me to express. So I wanted to welcome our wonderful creative arts organizer to tell you a little bit more and uh, get this open mic started. So thank you so much for having us. And if anyone wants to get involved, donate, connect about peer support space, feel free to find me after. But I now want to welcome uh, Quincy Wilson, also known as Q Major, who is our creative arts organizer and just a wonderful, wonderful human. If you can please give him a warm round of applause. <laughs> Hi, and thank you, Yasmin, for that amazing introduction. As she said, I'm Quincy Wilson, AKA Q Major. I am a performing artist, poet, spoken word, well, spoken word artist, poet, actor, um, and mental health activist. Um, in addition to that, I am also the creative arts organizer with Peer Support Space, and we do a lot of great work there. Uh, we have workshops on dance, acting, whether that's improv, um, using different acting techniques and things like that. We also have poetry um, and many others. But we'll be starting back in July. So if you would like to connect, if you'd like to find out about the workshops, maybe attend some, or just get more information, please speak to me after. Um, but yeah, I would like to introduce the first artist. So the first poet of the evening is going to be Riley Forrest who has lived experience uh, dealing with mental health issues and is also a mental health advocate. Please give a round of applause for Riley Forrest. Uh, I'm just gonna start us off. I'm just gonna go for it. <laughs> the number times I have been discriminated against has to, by now, exceed the number of lines that have been carved into my body. It gets too difficult to count every number that comes across my line of vision when my mind obsesses over every number that comes across my line of vision. <laughs> I carved lines in my body to keep score. What was the game and how did the score work? I have yet to find out. I did it anyway just in case, 
just in case I ended up winning, just in case keeping it on record could help me, could help somebody else just by keeping it on record on me, could help them see me. I carved lines for every time, every time I was not smart enough, fast enough, strong enough, feminine enough, young enough, old enough, black enough, French enough, white enough, feminine enough, good enough, 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 enough. 14 times is the number of times I have said the word enough 15 times in this poem. Do you think that is enough 16 times or should I say it one more time just to get the point across? If I could just get the damn point across enough 17 to run parallel to the tally count on my wrist then I think it would be enough 18. I started going by Riley. Every time I heard Renee, I would think of the child who endured so much trauma that their body did not know what to do with it. And Renee means to be reborn, and every day I went as Renee, I would just try to rebirth myself to just be enough 19 of whatever would get me through the day. Riley. Riley means brave and courageous warrior. Brave enough 20 to be able to stop counting, courageous enough to no longer keep score on my body. As I think now, no matter what name I call myself, I will always be disabled. There's no cure for what I have, not yet anyway. The doctors just don't know enough, 22, about fibromyalgia yet. Riley, brave, courageous warrior. Riley, me, we, I, I am enough, 23, and someday I will stop counting. Yeah. I'm going to do one more for you guys, uh, but because I have lived experience with mental health, I take medicine, and that leaves dry mouth, so give me one second. <laughs> Alrighty, here we go. Google defines addiction as the fact or condition of being addicted to a particular substance, thing, or activity. However, you shouldn't take the internet for pure fact because this definition leaves out one key piece. Addiction is a disease. Don't worry, you won't catch it if I sneeze. I am an addict. There's no vaccine. No Pfizer or Moderna, one day at a time, I fight to stay clean. Google defines the verb addicted as being mentally and physically dependent on a particular substance, unable to stop taking it without incurring adverse effects. You see these adverse effects in these verses that I read. Addiction is a disease. And so far, I am one of the lucky ones. It is a privilege to be sober, to have a roof over my head, clothes washed every night I sleep in a bed. I am blessed. I am one of the lucky ones. I have had so many friends die that they are all I can write about. My survivor's guilt fills me with imposter syndrome and doubt. I write about my dead friends so much that you would think I was a killer giving my confession in a murder trial. The courtrooms being every late night mic, the courtrooms being every late night open mic in town. I place my feet firmly on the ground. I place my right hand on the microphone like it's the Bible. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, because like chemo fighting cancer, connection fights the habits of addiction. You must be honest, open, and willing to stay clean. It's more than just putting down the bottle of Jim Bean. And I swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. But the truth is, I miss my friends so much that you would think each death leaves a mark on my skin. I yearn for each one to heal and then miss the itch as the scab cease to peel. The healing growing over the hurt new ground growing from dirt. And I know I am not responsible for any of my friends' deaths. Just how I am not responsible for the sun rising every morning, that is to say I do not hold that kind of power. I do not pour alcohol down anyone's throats, put pills to their lips, cut powder, inhale, exhale, just wake me in an hour. Addiction is a disease. It will not dissipate or go away with ease. Getting sober is the scariest shit I have ever done. The cravings come and go and make me wish I was numb. And I tell the 
truth. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, but sometimes the truth is that I wish it were me who had been lowered down the six feet instead of, insert name, most of most recently dead friend here. May they rest in peace, because sometimes it takes the life of another, seeing all the mourning fathers and mothers to really grasp the gravity of addiction. Writing about these feelings make me think I have outsmarted the grieving process, realizing I can never outsmart the jury that lives in my mind every time another friend dies. Mm. With each new death, I swear never to change my sobriety date. I swear to tell everyone I love you before it's too late, and sometimes I just can't. I fall short. I slip, the demons begin to dance, I give in to the cravings. Y'all heard of Narcan? That should be life-saving. Laughter is the best medicine, and dark humor is how I cope. Genuine duh. <laughs> poetry is my outlet, and genuine connections give me hope. Some dude on the corner offers me dope, and I said, hell yeah. I mean, fuck no. Telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth means admitting to my imperfections, confessing to the world that I am doing my best, and living this life as a recovering addict means speaking up and showing up so someone else won't be too scared to do the same. I still write about my dead friends so much that their deaths won't be in vain. The truth is, I hold no power in whether the sun will rise tomorrow, but I do have the power to believe that it will. I am one of the lucky ones. Are you a friend of Bill's? Thank you, thank you, thank you, Riley. That was amazing, very touching. Uh, so this next poet, he is in, he's an English teacher and he's also been performing in the Orlando poetry community for over a year now. Can you please give a big round of applause for Owen? Could I have a slice of cheese, please? A little slice of cheese folded with a bit of Valium tucked in between. My older brother had to tell the definition of manic to me. On the phone, I felt like a bother, fingers dribbling up and down the screen, perusing ticket clinic, thinking, do I pay for therapy or West Palm Beach court fees? My new own personal definition of insanity. Use your mania. I told myself I could use it. I have this toxic need for things to feel useful. And when your energy level flocks back and forth, you learn to clinically sort them. Use your mania. I learned to indulge myself as if it made me more myself. My brain doctor brother told me to get on medicine and I refused his help. What kind of person asks for help? I refused to pray for my brain to change. So I indulged my need to lay in bed all day and when I'm up, I tell myself, use your mania. Your room is still messy. If you don't use it, you might lose your mania. Use your mania. Your brain alarm clock cannot hit snooze. Your thoughts won't get tamer. Use your mania. Your schedule's got a lot of room. You've got bipolar two, you've got too many things you still need to do, so you ought to use your mania. Thank you. This next artist, um, all of the artists have gone on, I'm very close to all of them, I love all of them, love all of your work. I support all of you wholeheartedly. Uh, but this next artist, I have known for a very long time, um, and they paint pictures with their poetry using, I'll, I'll just let you see. But if you can give a round of applause for Don Neil Brown, AKA Blackbird. Hi everyone. Hi. 
I can't really see y'all, but I'm sure you look great. Um, okay. Right? Okay. When I think of the past, I don't allow myself to fall. In fact, I create scenarios where the shit that happened never really happened. At least that's what my mother taught me. Play games, she said. Hide and go seek, but never seek what you're too scared to find. Place emotions in boxes. Be woman with loud voice, but no feelings. Be cold to a world that will whiplash you into obedience. So I did that. Because ice in a world that demanded fire seemed like the best way out. Isn't that the first thing they teach you as a woman? To leash your tongue lest you be taught a lesson. A lesson in love and betrayal and forgiveness all in the same breath. Then wake up the next day and be whole again. For a woman that shows too much emotion is weak. Acting as if your heart wasn't a pawn in his world so I accepted it. The leftovers from others. Scraps of love found at the bottom of his heart and I made it work. It's crazy what you'll do in the name of love, in the name of trying to find some sort of mental health. So I ran, this time for a good reason. His fist knew how to tame that in one breath, showed me that being woman I have no control, or at least that's what he tried to teach me. Or being woman you are open thighs and soft lips created only for passion, supposed to be lucky or blessed when a man bestows himself within you. I became shield. I became walking treasure chest and willing to let another person in. So when I fall, I do that thing that has never been done for me. I leave my heart on a platter, a sacrifice for the taking, for the brave, for the person where I am enough because I believe that I'm enough. There's no such thing as too much. My body and my mind are allowed to be soft, to be soft and luxury and feminine, exist in a space where I don't need to be strong. The strong woman stereotype is left for others to choke on. All I have to do is be me. All I have to do is be woman. Thank you. Amazing, right? Can I get a round of applause for everybody who's gone so far? <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, so this next poet, he is an amazing um, performer, artist, actor, um, advocate for many different things. And he really has a way of bringing people into his world and getting them to understand his experience. If you could please give a quick round of applause for Q Major! <clears throat> Growing up as a queer black boy, you seem to find yourself sinking. So then I got older and wrote a poem to encourage you to embrace yourself. Queer black boy, you ain't supposed to exist, ain't supposed to love, ain't supposed to love another man, ain't supposed to live, ain't supposed to breathe, ain't even supposed to be possible. You go against the very nature of black man, they tell you queer black man ain't a thing, ain't real, you ain't real as if every queer black boy don't experience at least one hate crime in their life as if F-U-C-K be the only F word in your vocabulary like ones that start with F and end with get. Don't end, don't roll off your tongue too. Like it ain't derogatory like the N word. Ain't the only hate word you adopted. Queer black boy, you ain't supposed to exist. Only loved if you dress up in makeup and high heels. Only love for making them laugh. Only love when you're the clown cause queer black men don't exist unless we're clowns, right? Unless we're entertaining, unless you don't see us as men, right? We not prideful, at least not supposed to be. Not black and proud, not queer and proud, not man and proud, cause we, we ain't supposed to exist. Cause we ain't supposed to be black, queer, and man. Dear queer black men from and inspired by all queer black men, you can be fierce and powerful. Dress up however you choose. You can be the best artists, fathers, 
protectors, innovators, entrepreneurs, CEOs. You can be the very best. You be black, you be queer, you be man, you be proud. Queer black men ain't supposed to exist. Yet we set the world on fire. Have electric tongues that dance words like little ballerina ants creating sparks. We be shocking people with our being. We be like fireflies lighting up the night sky. Magic. Queer black boys ain't supposed to exist because we aren't masculine or masculine enough as if we didn't craft the very definition of masculine as if we are not masculinity at its finest, as if. As if queer black boys ain't supposed to exist. But here we are, here I am living, breathing, existing, and if I might say so myself, unapologetically doing so, signed by a queer black man. <laughs> Thank you. And the final poet of our feature that we will have for the night, um, I hold very near and dear to my heart, as I do with every other performer. Um, she is coming. You know, she's originally from Jamaica, and she is a spoken word artist. She's a singer, songwriter, um, all around amazing human being. If you can quickly give me a round of applause for Aretha Rodney McDonald. Hi guys. Okay, she was right, I can't really see y'all. But I'm sure you guys are looking great. All right, so I'm gonna do a piece for you guys and I'm gonna do a quick song and then I'm gonna get out of your ear. Is that all right? Okay. I love me. And I can now say that proudly. Cause see, I've been at a place in my life where my insecurities got the best of me. Where my identity was stripped away from me daily, forgetting who I was just to gain others' perception of me. Meanwhile, wearing a brightest smile, but deep down inside, I'm suffocating from the toxicity of my lifestyle, and I tried to play the blame game. But the common denominator was always the same, me. I allowed people to add to my pain, multiplied my pain by shame, subtracted all my confidence and divided everything that kept me sane. I gave them access to power that was never theirs to obtain. But see, one day I prayed, and with a whole lot of help from up above, I got reintroduced to this thing called self-love. Because I had love to give this entire world, but when it came time to loving this girl, love became non-existent. But see, the love I find in myself now, it's priceless. I'm so impressed with my progress, I won't allow anyone to suppress my success. And if you come into my life with anything less than the best, be my guest, you can exit left. Cause from this point on, I only want better. And anything opposite better will be a vendetta, cause now I'm real clever. I messed around and found out I'm a treasure. Far from a beggar. Begging for validation, begging for appreciation, begging for conversation. Well, let me give you some identification. I'm God's most prized possession. And the love I find in myself ain't up for negotiation. Staying true to my worth is an obligation. Being the best me I can be, cause in this generation, sometimes you gotta be your own inspiration. But see, there was a few things that needed to be done. The battle with self-love had to be won. I had to learn. Toxic situations didn't need to be undone. Now listen, the journey to a better version of you has already begun, so take pride in knowing there is no one quite like you under the sun, so shine. And here's a cheat code to my guideline. Let go and let God. Cause once you got God a part of your squad, he'll expose all the frauds. All the ones with the fake applause, the ones with the you go friend, but in the end it's all pretend. Ooh, toxic. I say all of that to say this, I love me. And you should love you too. Cause there is nobody in this world as particular as you. Thank you. All right, guys. This song is called Hey You, and Q, Major, it would kill me if I left tonight without doing it. And um, it's just a, a song, just leaving you guys with some inspiration, some motivation, because sometimes it gets hard, okay? Hey you, hey you, yeah you. 
no secret in this life what you've been through but keep your head up don't you get fed up no hey you hey you yeah you there's this one thing that you've gotta do you gotta stay prayed up it's the best way to boss up Second, all right? If I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it right. That's okay? Hey, you, hey, you, hey, it's no secret in this life what you've been through. Keep your head up, don't you get fed. checked in everyone's that's here but if you did not talk to either one of us make sure that you do just in case I don't call you because maybe I may think that you're not here we're gonna start with Anthony then we're gonna have Doug and Harold in that order so if you could please stand up come forward and be ready and uh, each of you has five minutes so Anthony Doug and Harold Everybody doing tonight? Yeah. Good, good, good. good. Uh-oh, uh-oh. You said fire? <laughs> All right, I'll try. Let's see. So I've got two poems tonight. Um, going in. Um, both are kind of dealing with uh, mental health, obviously, because, you know, it's mental health month. Um, the first one's more about a homeless guy I ran into. 
And it's just, when you hear the poem, you understand that he had his own issues and he was going through something and I think he just needed a little uh, compassion. So I'll go through that piece. Um, it's about other things too, but I just want to make sure I'm pointing it out. This piece is called Bang Bang at Lake Yola. I parallel park beside a meter flashing free on the way to a party, family and me. In plain sight, he's where light doesn't reach beside bricks, sun bleached. He leans against the wall outside a bar he isn't allowed in, a fixture and banished by Lake Yola urbanites wearing skinny jeans tucked into Balenciaga boots on electric scooters for rent. He speaks nonsense to deaf ears and reality to the, to the keen listener. Shoot him up, bang, bang, he says. Shoot him up, he says. They cage me, free me to prison. I sleep on pavement I've barely eaten since. I nod to nonsense to his memoir. A woman six inches taller than six feet, fashion week walks past. She fires a glance like a firearm. He winces, shoot him up, bang, bang, he says. Gorgeous family, shoot him up, take it easy. A man wearing glasses fires again. Bang, bang, he says, relenting his forehead. Moments are moments, but I saw a person die two of umpteen times he'll die today. It burns, hot gun barrel pressed firm. In the elevator, a woman swipes her keys card, asks if we are new residents, visiting I grimace. At the party, I sip a drink, eat sushi and salmon, laughing, but keep seeing the same man walking the same dog in the, same, in the hall of, er, Back up. Oh. <laughs> but keep seeing the same man walking the same dog in the hall adjacent to the recreation hall we celebrate in. Seven, eight times in 30 minutes. He fires each time. Bang, bang. I absorb them. The party ends. The exit is less eventful than entrance. We get to the car. Now he's lying on pavement, shivering and mumbling. We leave him our blanket. Shield for stairs even colder. Sandwich to eat. And M&Ms to show him life can still be sweet. This next piece, um, it's funny because there's a, a, a fellow poet here, uh, one of the people was just on this, uh, this stage. Uh, we did a, a writing exercise in a, a workshop some time ago, and uh, this came out of that. So that's, I'm kind of proud of it, you know, because it actually came, on, came from a conversation I had with a fellow poet. Um, and it, de it directly deals with mental health. Uh, and not, this is a time in my life in a, in a situation where I personally, you know, I, I wasn't okay, but I was saying I, I was okay. And this, this, is, this, this poem is me coming out of that. The piece is called The Cell. <clears throat> this, I built this. I laid each minute of silence. Bricks I mortared each time I said, I'm okay. I laid bricks to blisters bled paintings. Hieroglyphs painting bricks of my half-finished cell, not one drop drip from my dehydrated eyes. I sat quietly, decaying like a skeleton cage for millennia. I want them back. The millennia, I sat decaying in echoes of my own breath. I want it back. Want every drop I dabbed on every brick. Let them bleed back into torn flesh. Let them feel veins drained dry as bricks I laid. I want the bricks too. Minutes and seconds that wall me into this room intended for rotting, this cell. I'll drag each brick back to my mother and tell her these bricks are me, all my broken pieces and the mortar. The many conversations, the many phone calls when I said, I'm okay, I tell the truth. Mommy, I'm in pieces. I can't stop dreaming of the day, the phone call. The moment I knew the trip P and I planned was being buried in Lake Worth Veteran Cemetery with him. He was the glue. He was there at every game, there at every wrestling match, there when I couldn't get a call back for a job, there to patch every hole. Now P's the void, the hole, the key missing from my keychain, the key I know I've lost. I tell her everything. What is everything? I don't know exactly what I'd say or how I'd say it, but it wouldn't be anything like, yeah, 
I'm okay. All right, that's it. <laughs> I'm gonna plug myself real quick. So I think some a lot of you guys I've already connected with, um, but feel free to connect me with, with me if you haven't connected with me. Um, you can follow me at TC the Grio. It's spelled out TC the and Grio is spelled G R I O T. Grio G R I O T. All right, thank you. Thank you, Benoit, and everybody who has put this night together. This is my first time here, I love it. Yeah. I'd like to share a Christmas story with you. And yes, I realize it's May, but the other night I rewatched a movie called Smoke, starring Harvey Keitel and William Hurt. And in it, William's character told a tale called Augie Wren's Christmas Story. And every time I hear this story, it pierces my heart. So the way I see it, any time is a good time for a good story. And this is a good story. <laughs> it was Christmas Eve, and I was on my way to Jacksonville, Florida to spend the holidays with some dear friends. I checked my voicemail, one message, please pick up firewood on the way. Fantastic. These friends are tribe, and our only item on the agenda was to spend time together. That being the case, I still feel better when I have an opportunity to offer something other than my divine presence. Yeah. <laughs> so I glanced at my watch, which read 7.45 p.m., and I thought, where in the world am I going to find an open firewood selling store this late on Christmas Eve? So I continued the drive, and as if Santa himself paused his route to offer my gift early, I see a home goods store lit up like a Christmas tree, indicating there may be life within. Not only that, but when I pulled into the parking lot, what to my wondering eye should appear? A huge pile of firewood right outside the front door. $4.79 per bundle. A Christmas miracle! <laughs> oh, I gave thanks to jolly old St. Nick. I parked my car pulled a $20 bill out of my pocket and walked towards the front door, eager to find a friendly employee to help me complete the transaction. Boom, the doors are closed. Locked tight. Ugh. It was 8.04 and apparently the store had closed at eight o'clock. It was like running downstairs on Christmas morning to open my presents, only to find my stocking stuffed with coal. Oh, there were lights on inside, and I saw customers milling around. I held up my $20, caught the eye of an employee, and just asked her to take it so I could have some firewood. We're closed, was all she said in a muffled through-the-glass voice. Yeah, I can see that, I said to myself. I didn't think the door was broken. <laughs> oh, I just want to buy some firewood. We're cold, she said again, although this time it sounded like she was bound and gagged in a duffel bag stuffed inside someone's trunk. Or perhaps that's just what I was dreaming of doing to her should she continue to stand her ground. <laughs> oh. Well, I decided to try another tactic. Is this your firewood? While well, I pointed to the huge pile of firewood for sale just outside the door. Yes, it is. Can I please just take a couple of bundles and give you this $20? Please? We're closed, <laughs> was all she said. Obviously, this conversation was going nowhere. It was late. She was tired. She was away from her family on Christmas Eve and grateful it was closing time. Totally understandable. I, of course, saw the situation a little differently. It's Christmas Eve, come on, show some compassion. <laughs> she apparently thought the compassion ought to be going in the other direction. So I did notice that there were some customers uh, inside watching the situation, apparently thinking, we're staying out of this, buddy. <laughs> You're on your own. I couldn't believe she wouldn't take my money. Just I didn't even care, she pocketed it. <laughs> 
I, you know, just wanted some firewood. Completely dejected and a little miffed, I walked back to my car, grumbling as any practice victim would do. And then it hit me. <laughs> as if my coal go stocking were turning coal into gold, it hit me. I couldn't help but chuckle to myself. I know how to get them to open the door. <laughs> my heart raised, but I knew this was definitely the next course of action to take. I went, started my car, I pulled it around front, I got out, walked up to the firewood, picked up a bundle and brought it back and loaded it. Hey, what do you know? I had firewood. <laughs> my pulse was increasing rapidly while my mind drifted just enough to foresee some possible scenarios playing out, none of which bode well for me. Still, I pressed on, slowly, so as not to show anxiety or a demonstration that I was acutely aware that I was being naughty, not nice. I walked back over to the firewood, picked up a second bundle, and continued my shopping. Guess what? Not only did I get someone to open the door, I got a manager. <laughs> He spoke in a voice that was extra low and extra serious, so as to unveil his notion that he meant business. Can I help you? He asked. Oh, hey, I said while I walked over and picked up the $20 that I had paid. I stuck the $20 underneath the, uh, the firewood strap of the cheerful display. I gave it to him instead, and I said, this is for the firewood, I'm just taking four bundles. Well, while he considered that, I continued to load, and by the time he spoke again, I was on my fourth bundle. Oh, well, okay, was all he said. Thanks, I replied, and I was out of there. <laughs> Mission accomplished. I immediately called my friends to let them know I had succeeded, and they let me know how grateful they were. Not for the firewood, mind you, but for the fact that they didn't have to bail me out of jail on Christmas Eve. <laughs> okay, perhaps it was dumb. But now, Augie Wren is not the only one with his very own Christmas story. First and foremost, I'd like to pay my respects to the Creator without whom nothing is possible. Mm. I'd like to welcome you all with the warmest of greetings, and that is the greetings of peace and love. Yeah. Um, the piece that I want to share with you tonight is uh, dedicated to John Lennon and inspired by his song, Imagine. So this is my poetic rendition of John Lennon's Imagine, Reimagined. Mm. Imagine something ruthless. Imagine a girl who got mugged. Imagine young brothers and sisters overdosing on new drugs. Imagine a war in the Middle East. Let's all take time out and imagine peace. Imagine school. And imagine if you don't make it, you'll be considered another, another uneducated fool. Imagine this. Imagine that. Imagine if your mom was addicted to smack. Or your little son. Or your little daughter, as a matter of fact. Imagine the state the world is in, where athlete receives a multi-million dollar contract swinging at a ball over and over again. But just outside the stadium, a hundred yards away, a homeless person died today. They were defeated and beaten because it's been so long since they've eaten. Imagine what kids get the idea to acquire automatic weapons and kill other kids. Imagine a newborn baby whose mind is static. Was it their fault they were born a drug addict? Imagine a young lady on welfare, brand new car, fresh nails and hair. Imagine those who struggle and try to make it. Imagine a young girl's body found raped and naked. Imagine the guy who sells our kids poison. Imagine the girls and the boys in the orphanage living a life of abandonment. Imagine the thoughts in my mind if you can handle it. Imagine the struggling mother who sells her body to get paid. Imagine who gonna love her little babies after she didn't die with AIDS. Imagine your own mama and how she feel if you caught up in this drama. Imagine your brother and your sister and how much your nieces and nephews really miss you. So if you imagine that life's a game, Imagine at what point that we got to make a change. We got to concentrate, elevate, and break these mental chains. Because we don't, generation after generation will grow up and imagine the same things. 
and that's a damn shame. Imagine sunshine, imagine rain, imagine happiness, imagine pain. Imagine children living in the ghetto and what we have to do to imagine change. Thank you. I just want to mention that we're always so happy to have new people and always so happy to have people who come over and over and over again, like Harold and Anthony, and then a new person like Doug. So this is a space that we want to be uh, welcoming, where we can be our authentic selves all the time. So thank you so much for making this possible. All right. Uh, thank you. <laughs> all right. We're going to have Curtis. John, I think we have enough time for Arjen. And then we're going to end with Carly. Did I not call someone who signed up and is here? Phyllis? OK, great. All right, so let's go. Let me just Let's go Curtis and John and Phyllis. How about that? All right? OK, perfect. A uh, quick plug. One, if you want to protest DeSantis's unjust law, this is mostly for people who are watching this live on streaming, and you're in Florida, uh, you can get cheap uh, attire at thrift shops. If you live in Orlando, I personally recommend Out of the Closet on the corner of Virginia and Mills. They are gay and trans friendly. Secondly, if you want to support gay, trans, artists, international artists, please go to the Orlando Fringe Festival. I'm probably heading over there after night. People have come from all around the world. I saw a show that was put on a, by a director from Italy. It was really cool. If you don't know anything about it, talk to me afterwards. Uh, this poem has two dedications. For Jared, my best friend of over 20 years, as he prepares to move to Texas for reasons that have nothing to do with politics. For Drew, one of the Orlando 49 who lost their lives during the shooting massacre at Pulse nightclub, namesake of the Drew Project, a nonprofit working to support and enrich the lives of LGBTQIA plus youth, and Jared's former roommate. Ode to love books. My favorite thing about you is that your pronouns are they, them. When swarms kamikaze decorate themselves across the grills of our vehicles, it's called a car mustache. And what's gayer than facial hair? <laughs> you insults to binary, puckus mascots of nuisance, twelve-legged flag bearers on behalf of PDA, forget Bud Light. There needs to be a brewing company called PDA, just so your image can grace across the cans and bottles. I love your red, like you wear your heart on your thorax. They forget your name consists of two verbs, bug, to annoy or pester. The worst cliche in spoken word is realize, realize, realize. Today I realize love bugs are insects, insects, insects. You are insects in separate sections engaged in coitus. I want a love so pure, so loud, it inconveniences everyone around me, around us, the kind that pops up on the glass as if to say, hey, you getting any lately? <laughs> Shameless perverts, you turn us all into reluctant voyeurs. Give me love that flies too high above the law, too small to be latched by handcuffs, unencumbered beneath the sun. You show Icarus how it's done. Locals say, I don't care what they do, so long as they don't rub our faces in it. And where have I heard that before? You twerk your passion atop the bridge of our collective nose, and there's nothing we nor state government can do about it. They get upset watching couples hold hands in public. Monuments to drag, you wear each other's bodies as costume. No one knows where you end, and your other half begins skybound jellyfish. Black dress anemones, two heads like royalty on playing cards. Chinese finger traps turn inside out, digits crawling out of the opposite ends. If God has a face. I promise their mustache is a rainbow. <laughs> Who needs color after thunderstorms when we have you, both of you, all of you, rising from the damp of swamps, harbingers of sweat, of humidity, the hot and ruthless summer. Officials demand something 
fierce and predatory to wrap the kingdom, postcard nightmares armed with claws and teeth, gators, sharks, panthers, black bears, possums, real ones know you're the state bird. <laughs> Patron of our home is you, both of you, all of you. The most Florida thing about you is that you're relentlessly obnoxious, <laughs> refusing to vanish easy, Obnoxious list lives next door, neighbor to resilience. I picture you being born as plague, biblical in scale, black cloud hatching out the throat of cyclones. The governor tells us, don't say gay. DeSantis said, Florida is where woke goes to die. You don't die. All you do is multiply. If anyone wants to police sexuality, they should start with you. They who claim to be anti-immigrant, the emblem of Winter Park is a peacock, a bird that's not even from North America. <laughs> they only value outsiders, they, 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 only, they only value outsiders that make them look pretty, then turn around and tokenize the ones who helped them with fashion since years ago. At the open mic I used to frequent, we'd end the night with quotes. Audience members volunteered platitudes for everyone to carry throughout the week. Curtis McKinnon said, quote, go where you're celebrated, not where you're tolerated. And for years, I kept that in my back pocket. Really, I did. For years, I thought that one was a real gem, but now that I'm older, I realize that Outlook's elitist. Rosa Parks wasn't celebrated, at least not on that bus. MLK wasn't celebrated the day he crossed that bridge at Selma. John Lewis got his skull cracked by state troopers. The more I think about it, that quote is dangerous, at least self-serving. The more you go where everyone loves you, the more you satisfy your ego. Maybe the point is we're supposed to go where everyone hates us just so that they have to deal with us being there, being here, our existence providing a lap dance they didn't ask or pay for. We're meant to travel town to town like Jesus preaching to the choir guarantees you never get put on a cross. Maybe we're supposed to get our haters and adversaries in their feelings force them to adapt to our presence. Maybe we're meant to show up like you. You're an invasive species. Rumor says escapees of a college lab experiment gone wrong. <laughs> but that's not true. And ain't that a metaphor? How easier it is to conjure up excuses, pass them off as urban legend about strangers, lifestyles you already disapprove of than to do actual research. How it takes less effort to dismiss queer folk and immigrants as monstrosities than it is just to Google history and identities, terms and pronouns, how easy it is to make up lies about someone than it is to self-educate and do the work, face down so-called threats that might change your mind. When we don't take interest in active learning about the other, what we're saying is we don't think the other is interesting enough to care about. There is nothing this world needs less than tolerance. We tolerate global warming. We tolerate love bugs the same way we tolerate a traffic jam or babies crying on commercial flights. The world doesn't need more tolerance. The world needs irritation to provoke action. We need compassion and understanding. No one needs to hear you're different and, and that's okay. I don't want to agree to disagree. We must be told you're different from me. And that's beautiful. That's wonderful. Please tell me more. Maybe invasion is the whole point. Some days you got to look in the mirror. Remind yourself I was put here to take over. Whatever appreciate, wherever appreciation is impossible, invasion becomes inevitable. 49 people were gunned down inside Pulse. Will you dare dance and spin and float and love unrestricted throughout the open air? There's that L word again. The world is your dance floor. The world is your gender neutral restroom. The wilderness is far too wide. The atmosphere too open to ever be a closet. Another June lies on the horizon. Once again, we're supposed to forget we're supposed to act like homo and transphobes in office aren't busy spitting on 49 graves. Grand marshals of the pride parade, you give us example worth emanating. The answer was always on our windshields. It's easier to keep on driving, to dismiss bodies smashed across the hood as collateral than it is to recognize someone's queer child as a martyr. As far as science knows, you're harmless. No stingers, no blood sucking, no venom. You don't damage anyone's crops. You just piss off the right people. 
Your larvae actually eat decaying vegetables, a process that benefits humans, farmers, and their customers, just like how drag acts and theme park employees boost an economy based on tourism and entertainment. No one wants to give you credit either. There's just too many of them. Amen. Gadfly, noun, an annoying person, especially one who stirs others into action via criticism. For every new joke about Florida, man, there's someone skipping over valid discussion points. The meme says Floridians care more about love bug season than hurricane season, and that's everything you need to know about this state. <laughs> Again, metaphor for the non-straits who live here, why are lawmakers more intimidated by other sex lives than by weather that's literally set to destroy our homes? Why are we more concerned with whose asses are touching than the housing market or cost to repair property? Why is butt stuff a bigger issue than potholes or gun violence in our schools? Morgan Wilson told me, when you're above it all, how can people not look up to you? Dave Chappelle says, those alphabet people, I call them love bugs, capital L. This state is full of love bugs. All my heroes were gadflies. All my icons were somebody's pest. All my heroes led parades, riots, marching armies of inconvenience. They made everyone around them work harder. They who forced adjustment, who drank in protests from whites only water fountains, who forced evolution throughout the community and society at large. They won't hand you your propers, won't call you butterfly beautiful, place you upon the same throne as monarchs and blue morphos. They deny your glamour. Chose to look down, choose to look down on insects. God, don't make ugly. They won't say you're beautiful, but fuck it, I'll celebrate you. I see you riot role models. I see you gender mavericks. You middle fingers buzzing in the face of grammar. You who exist to disgrace us. You blight against cosmic loneliness. Your lives so simple, so honest. They named you after the one practice you're known for. The lesson being that life might all be really about finding someone to hold on to. Love is never a political statement, except in places where it has to be. If everything that soars above us is part angel, you're probably closer to the original version. Wheels on fire with compound eyes, vast, uncountable numbers of wings and limbs. Angels don't go where they're welcome. They show up where they're needed not where you're tolerated. Maybe the point is that we're supposed to change our environment by making ourselves part of it. We're meant to be landmarks. I hear white liberals say they got plans to ditch the state, leave behind the politics like that don't throw the rest of us still living here under the bus. Philosophy with a shrug, better you than me. The governor says Florida is the freest state. I hate to admit, I might agree. It all depends on who you're asking. It depends on your definition of free. Down here, it's nothing but traffic. Bumper to bumper along I-4, as far as the eye can see. The sky belongs to those who deserve it. Hallelujah. Wingspans can't be boxed in by closets or cages or caskets. Anything else that begins with K, cheers to you. Here's to you. I hear them scream unnatural. Angels get the fuck wherever they damn well please. Good evening, you guys. Good evening. I am the all star, the poetry rock star, the vegan gorilla, because vegans gorilla. All right, you guys, two quick pieces, brand new pieces. The first one is called Passenger 11B. I was sitting on a plane, and on walks this plain Jane, as some would describe, but she was a vibe. Looking like she was a bride from the tribe of Benjamin. She had just arrived on time. I closed my eyes, pretending I was asleep. Praying and he lusted me with flee. She had the whole cabin's attention. Did I mention every man was sweating sitting next to an available seat? I held my breath waiting for her to walk past, but she sat down in the seat next to me. Passenger 11B, noble. Regal, gracious, no makeup on her face, just a few arm bracelets, white linen shirt, her handmade long skirt. I peeked at her through my eyelids and didn't say a word. Every insecurity I had was heightened. I wasn't frightened. I was immediately aware of every flaw of mine. The moles around my eyes, my oily skin, did my forehead have a shine? Was my shirt making me look like I had man boobs? 
should have had on my grown man shoes. Instead, I was wearing sandals, pretending to fall into a deeper sleep. I slumped my body away from her up against the window. Carefully peeking at her attempts to adjust her full hips and thighs in between the hand rests. This is what you call cabin pressure. Beautiful skin without wrinkle or blemish. Bodies in the aisles walk past and smile. That's including women. Her perfume was lifted off her skin by the cold AC air. Entering my nostrils like sweet smelling incense. It could have been her hair. She periodically let out a subtle sigh as if her body was reaching new levels of relaxation. My mouth was watering as my imagination ran wild. Deep breaths in and out allowed me to let go of my erotic chaotic thoughts for now. I was definitely on board this flight. I fight not to say a word. Thoughts unravel as we travel through the clouds. Was she adventurous? Exploring new places? Was she headed to an exotic final destination? Was she going to see family? Was her trip business? I'm tripping. I need to mind my business. An internal dialogue began running through my mind. Some of the things I would say if the, I thought the interest was the same. Statements, jokes, Questions, gestures, pick up lines, all kinds of humorous measures. My first question wouldn't have been, what's your zodiac sign? I was more inclined to find out if she was kind, if she was aligned with the divine. She was fine, but did she eat swine? Where were her ambitions, her goals? Where did she see herself in time? What were her fears? Where would she be in the next five years? She probably thought I craved what was between her legs, but I yearned for what was between her ears. Was it fear or rejection, insecurity or pride? Or did I really just want her to sit back and enjoy the ride? Would I be filled with regret when this plane lands and she takes off in jets? She was undisturbed, never compelled to speak. I said nothing. I held my peace, quiet as a church mouse nibbling on cheese. At the end of our flight, she got up to leave. She turned and looked at me and said, thank you. I know you're awake. I know you've been pretending to be asleep this whole time for my sake. I appreciate your consideration allowing my flight to be quiet and therapeutic. I must admit I was laughing to myself. I didn't think you'd be able to do it. Now I'm off to the noise, the cat calls, my young boys, the whistles, the stares, the infringement on my personal space, no one cares, the unyielding flirtations. I want to thank you, sir, for giving me a real vacation. I slowly opened my eyes, nodded my head, and closed them again. Her and I would have made great friends. Passenger 11B, the end. <laughs> this next piece is entitled Substitute Teacher. I am the substitute teacher standing at the front of the class all eyes are fixated and fastened on my frame. Confused looks and questions whispered from whence I came. Wheels are turning as they're making assessments. Before I even open my mouth, judging my attire, guessing my weight, perceiving this is just going to be an easy day, the teacher's pet wants to eat me alive. Like a man who's fallen inside the lion's den, I've survived. I see stern faces, I see smiles, I see grins. Curiosity, where I've come from, from whence I've been, I am a stand-in. I stand in the place of the everyday assigned form that instructs you to follow the norm. That's not me. Sorry, kid, I'm off the grid. I break the rules. I come to schools and drop jewels, pointing you to a treasure found outside the box. I'm the professor with the locks. My antennas have sent out signals. Now that everybody's on board, chalk it up to my charm. Erase any pre-notions you may have had. You'd be surprised how many students coming from single-parent homes be thinking, I wish that was my dad. Keeping minds eager, validating the reader. I love the ones who probe for clarity, who search without being asked. I provide a newfound joy or a spark rekindled from the past. I want to learn, you say, making the day fly by. So much has been absorbed. You thought, man, this guy probably would have had me bored. I push hope. I don't sell dope. I peddle optimism. A light at the end of the tunnel. A breathing exercise. A verbal foot rub. An audible back massage. I'm what poetry and par prayer would look like if they were put together. I'm the umbrella during a rainy day. I'm a change of pace. A change in tone. A break from what you've already known. Now the subject of conversation which has caused you to put away your phone is me. A fresh face with fresh ears listening 
to lessons learned from a fresh perspective. I'm a glass of water when you have the hiccups, and I don't get hit up with spit balls or balled up paper. This is grade A beef over here. Even those who sit in the rear with their heads down are now sitting up in their chair with their heads raised, hands raised, questioning the things that are man-made. Next time, I know you'll be eager. Next time, I know you'll be eager. I said, next time, I know you'll be eager when I show up. Thank God for the substitute teacher. Hi there, I love poetry. It's a wonderful way to communicate. Yeah. And tonight this poet is gonna do her first reading. <laughs> it's a subject that's dear to all of us, our friends. Mm -hmm. My friends are my shadow selves, wind-like, indiscreet, often unnoticed, but always there. They guide my life, just as a morning mist lays over the garden quietly, the friends are there in spirit beside me, showing me what to do. Reminding me often of how the gloaming of evening quietly touches the broken pieces of day, left gently and lovingly. I also know that I must learn to embrace my friends because just as the morning sun will burn away the mist and even as I sit here tonight and write and the gloaming has taken away, uh, the winds have taken away the gloaming and I sit in darkness, I must embrace my friends because they will leave me. Life's events will take them away. Oh, they weren't kidding. You really can't see anybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, quick plug. I'm not going to do my usual drawn out intro. Follow Wednesday Open Words for a poetry open mic that happens every Wednesday. Riley Forrest is also a co host of that. And uh, yeah, um, cool. I'm trying to get used to wearing my hair down. I put coconut oil in it because, you know, Indian stuff. In, co in uh, consistency with the theme of the night, which is. Um, peer support through mental health, and also it's one of Riley's po um, favorite poems that I do. I'm gonna do uh, this piece. When you drive on the turnpike with your tank on E, you take it a chance. I mean, really, there's no telling when the last of the gas in your car will expire, and the flames that keeps those pistons firing comes to a screeching halt. But let's be honest. You know, you probably should have taken the pit stop at the rest area a few miles back, but you, you didn't want to hear that. Just didn't want to pay the price at the pump. Be fair, though, the gas prices are so expensive, aren't they? Especially at the rest area. I mean, honestly, if we're paying inconvenient prices for convenience, where exactly is the convenience in the first place? <laughs> but I should have stopped. Everything in me said I should stop, but I didn't. I persisted, determined only to stop once I reached my destination. But with that needle getting closer and closer to E, I find my eyes scouring the skyline, searching for a sign or escape in the form of an exit. I, I got to get off the road. But when you drive on the turnpike with your tank on E, your car is not running the way it's supposed to. Efficiency goes right out the window as your engine strains the capacity to keep those pistons firing. But when that last drop of gas does expire, all you can do is watch as the speed starts to fall when the engine gives out. I've got to keep up. The speed limit is 70 miles per hour. I've got to keep up. Everyone's really going 80. I've got to keep up. But when life throws speed bump at the speed bump at the speed bump at the speed bump, how exactly am I supposed to keep up? I can't slow down. I've got to slow down. This is not a racetrack. This is the turnpike. I can't stop. I've got to stop. I can't stop. I got to stop. I can't stop. But when your tank hits E, you stop. And the only way to keep moving forward is to step out into the sun, roll up your sleeves and start pushing, scouring the skyline, searching for a sign or escape in the form of an exit. 
<laughs> you let those other cars speed past you because this, this is not a racetrack. This is the turnpike. I'm not looking for a finish line. I'm just trying to go home. So when life throws speed bump after speed bump, maybe, maybe it's time to just stop. Read the signs. Say, uh, hey, I need some gas. Can I get a lift? <laughs> Follow Wednesday Open Words on Instagram, thanks. Good evening, everyone. Yay. Thank you. My name is Carly Gambroja, um, and I really appreciate everyone that shared so far tonight. That takes a lot of bravery and transparency and honesty, and I really appreciate, especially this month being you know mental health awareness um, in the Asian American community too. It's hard to have people talk about that, you know. Um, May is also AAPI History Month, Asian American Pacific Islander Month. Uh, so I'm honored to be here representing ABCs, American Born Chinese. Um, and American Born Chinese, Yeah, there you go. Um, tonight I have two pieces in honor of my mom who passed in 20, 2014. And um, I've been hosting a, a poetry hour workshop each week with some friends and it's on Instagram as well. Uh, poetry hour workshops with some writing prompts and tips and everything. Um, but I've been reading a lot more Asian American poets um, just to catch up on the scene. And Victoria Chang is really inspirational. Her um, book, Dear Memory, um, is one of the inspirations for one of the pieces tonight that I'll read. Uh, she uses photos um, and visual imagery um, to inspire poems. So without further ado, um, the first piece is called Transition. Bundled up in that season's puffy black winter coat with dark pink purse matching her undershirt and white silk scarf. Side by side with neighbor and husband, she scooped the bright yellow fruit from the autumn leaf strewn ground, happily complaining how large the harvest was that year. Later, she would pile 30, 40, 50 rounded pears on the dark wooden kitchen table, mumbling in Chinese about how she planned to pass them out to this auntie and that uncle who would enjoy the crisp, crunchy, juicy fruit, wonderfully apple-like in texture and pear-like in flavor. On our walks around the neighborhood, we would marvel at the tree as it transitioned from rich red-orange to gold before shedding its heavy jewelry for the stark, empty branches, free now to stretch every branch into the snow-filled skies, a war cry into the face of winter until spring returned to melt the cold from the landscape again. I returned to the house nine years later to see the tree, only to find the new homeowners had removed it. Instead, I return to the photos of my mom in front of the tree, arms full of fruit, waiting, frozen forever, for the seasons that never came for her. Thank you. Um, a lot of my pieces are around identity as an Asian American, culture, history, memories, grief, loss, infertility, whatever it might be. Um, so this next piece uh, is a, a part of a longer one, uh, but I'm grateful to share it with you. It's still in progress. It's called Hair. I got the first white hair when I was 12. Standing in my parents' bathroom, I remember leaning in, staring into the mirrored medicine cabinet, pinching the single hair firmly to pluck it from my scalp. Little by little, new ones would pop up and be removed, some straight and strong, others wiry and weirdly curly for Asian hair. Later, what was held off would show up all at once during the pandemic, as if someone took a thick, bristled brush dipped in white and skimmed it through the left side of my head, leaving frosty highlights trailing from roots to tips. I can't stop thinking about my mother's hair, 
When she would ask me to permit, I knew it meant we would spend the next 30 minutes without her nagging me about something, 60 minutes without me running away from answering her. Sitting her down in the little black circular fold-out chair, we made sure the extra-large garbage bag split open by shears was held firmly with one or two clothespins at the hollow of her neck like a cape of surrender, declaring temporary truce so we could share stories of relatives and questions about life, catching up on whatever was missed in daily moments spent apart. Using the same wide tooth plastic black comb she used to trim my hair, I parted hers. How nimble my fingers needed to be to section her ear length hair into small quadrants before wrapping it into tissue paper perm sheets, sprinkling water onto squared edges to ensure it stuck together as I rolled it up and snapped it into place with large bobby pin looking bars. Thick rollers rolled up and backwards from forehead to crown. Thin rollers for hair on the sides and the, and the back of the head rolled down and under. Each time I would reread the instructions between steps to make sure I didn't forget to mix the activator properly, set the timer, and apply the relaxer at the end. She used to color her hair by herself somehow holding a small mirror deftly enough to paint every side while her spotted kitchen towel was wrapped around her collar like a fashionable scarf. For a while, she used henna, like Aunt Doris did, turning each white hair a burnt copper bronze. Then there was box number six, found only at the medicine counter of Asian grocery stores, the perfect brown-black color for mom's specific shade requirements. I didn't see her full head of gray-white hairs until the last few months of her cancer treatments. By then, there was no more perm either, so the fullness was gone, leaving an oasis of white atop a gradient of faded black, which sometimes puffed up after extra hours asleep in bed. With just a little water and patience, I'd gently comb it back into shape. Nowadays, people dye their hair to make it white and silver. I have thought often about dyeing my white away, but then I remember, growing older is a gift, a privilege, something to be grateful for, to celebrate and not to cover up. I see little grandmothers with beautifully bright heads of hair glowing like the fullest moon on the darkest night. I count three solitary snow white hairs scattered on my husband's chin and temples and welcome them with warmth and gladness at what it means. We have survived another day, another year, another season. We are growing old together, one wrinkle, one white hair at a time. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause to everyone who was on stage tonight. <laughs>